Thank you, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. I'm glad to see folks have come out. And of course, folks on the Zoom session, welcome this morning. Um, yeah, so my name is Trivino Brings Plenty. I, for my uh, promotional material, I have Trivino L Brings Plenty. Uh, that, that started off because uh, you know, when you have a name that's your first name, that's a last name, and then you have a last name that has two words, I get different aliases with the mail I receive. And so I thought I'll clarify that by having the L that people can distinguish brings plenty as a last name that has two words. Now that just complicated things further. Now I have <laughs> stuff for L, bring, L brings plenty, L plenty, L Trevino. Um, uh, and, and you know, because my last name is not hyphenated, uh, that adds on to that confusion too. Um, so you know, Trevino Brings Plenty, is a, I think, is a kind of cool name. Um, my middle name is Larry, so it kind of like, not Lawrence, it's Larry. Uh, so it kind of messes with the flow. But Larry is useful because uh, when I go get get a coffee somewhere, I say my name is Larry because people can hear that more so than Trevino. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's where Larry comes in helpful. Um, <laughs> and I remember one time when I was, um, I was working on my MFA out of Santa Fe at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And you know, I, it's mostly online throughout the year. Then we go down there for two weeks uh, or one week at a time um, per, per year um, or per um, semester. And it, there in the Albuquerque airport, I was, as I was leaving the residency, you know, a week long workshop, intensive uh, presentations, engagement and uh, discourse on literature and specifically work with other native writers. I remember leaving the airport, sitting there, um, and I saw Larry David walk through. And actually I was walking behind them and you know, they're taller than I thought. They're, they're about as tall as me. Like, I think they're about 6'1 or so. I'm 6'1. Um, but Larry David has a walk. And I was like, yeah, that's Larry David. Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, watching Curb Your Enthusiasm and whatnot, you get the mannerisms. And so I started thinking in my head, like, man, I, because I really liked Larry David's work, um, like, how do I make that connection with Larry David? Um, and so that's. I was sitting there brainstorming that, and eventually, you know, I sat down. I saw they went to the bathroom. That would be really weird to follow him in the bathroom and try and engage with them there. So I kept it cool. And uh, where I sat, that was for the flight going to LA. And so they got on the, the line to go to LA on that flight. And that was my opportunity. They're right in front of me, so I can like, say something. And, you know, Kind of intimidating. You don't know if like how they would respond. Maybe don't want to be bothered. Um, but I had my in. I can say we're both Larrys. Um, so I don't know. That that would have. I think it might have worked. Um, how many other Larrys do you have? I don't know if there's like a hierarchy on Larrys. Like yeah, your Larry has to be your first name, not the middle name. Does that legitimize it? Or how? What's the uh, frequency they have to use Larry in order to be? Validate it as a Larry. That's that's why I don't know, but yeah. So that that's the L that I put in there, Larry. Um, it's from my grandfather. Um, yeah, they weren't Lawrence; they were Larry. And so I think about that with uh, names. So like, my, um, I'm Minikoji Lakota. I was born in uh, uh, Eagle Beach, South Dakota, on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation. And, you know, thinking about names and, you know, understanding of folks may know or may not know Native American history names and all that. So when I say Cheyenne River, people hear Cheyenne and think I'm Cheyenne, even though I'm Lakota. So like these names keep, you know, popping up and being distracted from actually or muddies the water of what I'm what I'm saying. So, yeah, Cheyenne River, Sioux Reservation there in South Dakota and Lakota, it's a. Uh, 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 Wakpa Wash Day is that's what we call it. So it's, it's the Good River. Um, uh, Wakpa being being river or waterway, and Wash Day meaning good. And, you know, because English is a backwards language, we have our adjectives behind the nouns, and so that's why uh, Wakpa Wash Day is that way. Um, 
so yeah, the I, I, I think of that, about that, you know, as many Koju Lakota, many Koju translates to uh, in English um, planters by the river. So we were river people. And so I, I, I think about that uh, association, you know, being here, being river people here um, among uh, the ancestral territories of the indigenous people here as well, like uh, these different uh, associations with uh, water, with river. And so I start to, you know, for me as a poet, you know, I, I, I think on stuff before I start moving on it and start writing about it. And so that association with river or waterway and, you know, being as a Lakota and what that may mean to be an urban Indian, meaning I was born on a reservation, but I grew up in the city. And so the, the cultural relationships that I have had is not necessarily uh, as strong or as um, daily as it would be if I lived among my, uh, my family back home. And so, but it changes into a different kind of relationship. You know, native folks would find other native folks and go to native events and find each other uh, in these cityscapes. Um, so the, those relationships were built and it develops a different kind of culture, of course, with other cultures in, in, the, in the area as well. So, you know, it becomes an amalgamation of other uh, ideas and perspectives and uh, engagement with whatever it is that we're trying to do. Um, so that, so for being an urban Indian, for me, you know, I'm always learning about that. What does that experience mean? And, you know, historically, you know, the dispossession of land the being pushed around. And so if I want to, I could even put it into the Lakota diasporium. Did I say that right? Diasporium? Diasporium? Diaspora? There you go. Um, that's, uh, you know, for folks who uh, read words and don't have the, uh, the audio thing with it. So I see the word and I try to sound it out. Um, so the Lakota diaspora in different areas, and what does that mean to have a sense of these uh, interrelated identities that develop the relationship to, in this case for me, literature, um, how do I put that work or those ideas, work with that material in the context of a cityscape with an urban Indian identity or relationship, whatever that may be. And so that for me as a creative person, you know, at the time I'm looking at, I have my book here, uh, Wak Pa Wanagi. Um, you know, I, one of my jobs was working at a nonprofit um, with uh, working in a foster care department uh, housing folks with Section 8 vouchers. And so I had a caseload of 20 families that worked with and was able to get them housed and seeing the challenges of what, what that may mean for that uh, uh, socioeconomic class and um, getting housing here at the time. And this is 2011, so, you know, uh, the, mar the, the experience of housing then, you know, kind of mirrors right now, but it's not as ramped up in terms of the scarcity or the perceived manufacturer scarcity of, that we have here. And so in doing that work, you know, working with uh, the urban native community, working with families uh, within a class standing, um, trying to get them housed and seeing the different aspects and how these relationships come together and, you know, building those trusts with those families. Um, I start to think about as river people, you know, uh, and especially being in a temperate rainforest, water is all around us, right? And so, you know, with the Standing Rock issue, we, we got the slogan, uh, call for uh, water is life and uh, mini, mini Wachoni. And so that stuff is certain, you know, I already knew that perspective before, but you know, so I started to put that together, how we're connected. And you know, reading stories about fish here that, you know, are, I don't know, uh, like there's things found in their, their bloodstream, like uh, uh, pharmaceuticals or illicit drugs. And uh, of course, Humans, we take stuff in, we evacuate it, and it enters the system, and it, we're connected to other things that are through water, and of course, water goes up, and then it comes back down to us in rain. So we're, uh, we're in this other cycle, this ecosystem, as part of that, we impacted by it, or change in different ways. So, you know, start to make those as a connective tissues to look at a city and the relationship that we have with each other. Um, you know, I, I think about, 
the circles I run in or have run in, um, uh, the Native American community here in the Portland area, uh, literature community, the music community, and the general art scene, of course, of a certain time, right? So in the early aughts, doing that work. And you know, at, at the time, uh, late 90s, early aughts, housing, you can get decent housing at the time and be like, you know, low income even then. Um, so, you know, I was able to do stuff like that and uh, connect with different people. And it's, it, every now and then those communities would cross pollinate. And so people would be surprised to see me in one community that they know I did this other stuff. And I don't know if that's, I mean, that's kind of my own doing. Like I ran in different communities that did different things. Um, so w with those kind of connections and those uh, different types of engagement in a city inside of a community, uh, it, well, you know, community is kind of weird in that they're more like pods, right? So we have our small groups of folks, but community is too abstract. So my, the different pods I ran in, and of course it's of a certain time, um, I'm, I have been, because I haven't been doing a lot of stuff in the Portland area, a lot of people have pushed out, been pushed out of the Portland area, new people are coming in, so it's changing the demographics here. Um, so I, I'm missing out on that component. So in putting together the, this book, Wakpa Wanagi, Ghost River, um, Wakpa is in Lakota, waterway, river, stream. Wanagi is a, a spirit that never, didn't have a physical form, if I remember that correctly. Again, English is a backwards language. Wakpa, Wanagi, river, ghost. Well, even if the literal translation is like that, it has like a poetic connotation. Um, so it's more like a spirit, river spirit, spirit of the river. Uh, and so I start to put like that connective tissue for everyone's experiences. Uh, to however I may uh, develop that in the poetics. Um, even ghost isn't really a good uh, translation because, you know, ghost to automatically may assume, I guess, spooky, scary. Um, but uh, from a, a Lakota ways of knowing, you know, that it's not, we're aware of things outside of us, the, the uh, spirit or energy, whatever you may call it is interacting with us. It's neither good or bad. It's just, these are these things are there. We just have to be careful about certain things. So, so ghost doesn't really, for me at least when I think about it, um, ghost doesn't help that much with what I'm trying to do in my conceptualization of the book, but ghost is also, ghost river is also a good marketing tool. So I think about that like, yeah, it, I lean into a little bit spooky if that draws people's attention because you think about demographics uh, what what are in, what interests people and you know sometimes at least for me I love like uh, ghost stories this uh, this creative nonfiction that people have with these things that happen and experiences so yeah I'm into that and same thing with like UFOs and conspiracy theories whatever that may be mostly um, at least what's been curated through my algorithms that's what I'm getting. Um, but this is, uh, w with that, the, 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 met the, the immaterial metaphysical things, uh, aliens or ghosts, and I think about that and, and doing this. It's not in the book, but my thinking is, if these, if these things are real, ghosts and aliens, um, let's not be secretive about it. Come out. <laughs> uh, I would love to travel to other places. I would love, you know, if they, uh, if ghosts are real, they can maybe go through time. We can get information and knowledge. That would be really good. I would like to know about things, maybe other time, what that may be. So we're missing out. If these things are, you know, really real, we're missing out on this incredible engagement. Um, and I think on some level, we won't be able to lie to each other too, right? Because you said something, but I can go talk to this ghost that can go back and <laughs> double check that so we can correct some of this information that we have. And same thing with UFOs or aliens. It's like, you can do stuff. We don't have to, if, you, if it's true that you're traveling all over the place and you can bend space and time and all that, uh, yeah, that'd be really cool. We can actually get to another level of engagement of our world around us, if they're real. Um, but 
you know, uh, on my, in my social media algorithms, um, uh, right now I'm switching over to, or engaging with TikTok, so it's interesting to see how that, that engagement, you know, I feed the algorithm what that may be. Um, so yeah, so Wakpa Wanagi, Ghost River, you know, oh, that's a tangent I went on for that, but um, <laughs> I'm, not spot, I'm not talking about aliens or, well, I would say people are kind of spooky in general, right? So uh, of the material and immaterial, we Im embody that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so in thinking about those relationships of uh, working with the community, at the, at the time, you know, uh, doing social work, um, you know, this, this material talk, touches a little bit on the, the uh, foster care relationship. And before that, I, I, I worked in a mental health institution for uh, at risk, mentally ill children or at-risk children, um, specifically with native, native, native kids. And so I, I touch on some of those stories as well. Because, you know, I, I think about, uh, at least in that one, where, you know, it's a high acuity with children. And so they're, they're needing to stabilize in these, these places. So for me, you know, I start to think about in that those are also the stories that my uh, previous generation ancestors have gone through as well. And so there is this uh, thing where, you know, as I get, as I've gotten older, my concept of time, ha I feel I have a, a better sound grounding of what that is. Like I conceptualize what 100 years ago looks like or 200 years ago looks like. It's not totally abstract or uh, hard to understand. So uh, thinking of the work I was doing here within the context of the time of where we are right now, at, at least in this generation, um, I can see parallels, at least in the work I was doing, of some of the experiences my ancestors have gone through. So I have had an ancestor who went to the Hiawatha and Salem Asylum there in South Dakota. You know, uh, looking through their record, it was um, diagnosed with epilepsy. But at the time, in the late uh, uh, 1800s, epilepsy was kind of like the it, it's all over as a diagnosis. Um, but you know. That, on the paper, that's the narrative that's being told, but within the context of settler colonialism and colonization, the, those people who were, were put into those places were usually folks who uh, spoke their Lakota language, they practiced Lakota uh, spiritual practice, ways of knowing, and so they were moved away from community, or at least that component of their relationship, the, the people with those relationships to land, spirituality, language, culture, uh, all that, they're removed from the community and placed in places and re-educated uh, re through the, at least through the sand asylums or the um, boarding school experiences. So at least for that relative, you know, I think back like this, there's a, there's a societal expectation or functionality that says one thing is not or cannot fit into another thing. And so they're put off into the, the other places, or it's intentional to disrupt communities to make sure you know that they, they don't function or are doing well as they should be. Um, and we see this over and over again. We can think of like uh, the prison industrial complex, what that may mean for impact of what is I consider the, the um, and other I mean other people talk about the reserve army of labor. Like what is actually made for the unemployed and underemployed. A group of people to maintain their class standing in order to subjugate and make sure wages are suppressed um, to have a, a giant pool of folks like that. And so, I, and thinking about uh, Native folks, specifically because I'm focusing on Lakota or the Ocheti Shakowin uh, nation, I try to make sense of what that may mean in this disruption, especially time right now where uh, you know there's an interest in indigenous things or what that may mean and for the general uh, population, under, understanding what that may mean that um, the narrative that goes out is really important. And so um, I, I think about that with the loss, potential loss of language or culture, at least for the, the Lakota people. And of course, in context of other nations, uh, pre-United States, their relationship, what may or may not be there anymore, or what has changed. 
um, those relationships are important. And so thinking of, of that context of, at least within my family line, in relationship to these different acts of uh, assimilation, relocation, termination, and, and how, uh, at least through my journey and my immediate family moving from uh, there in South Dakota, uh, or at least my mom's generation, moving out to California to have training, schooling, and then, of course, my immediate family moving up here to Oregon in, in 91, uh, what that may mean for development of labor uh, of a group of people being removed from land uh, to you know, better their, whatever their circumstances. Um, and it plays out that uh, we were poor in poverty there on our, our land economically, and then we continue that in the cityscape and coming up here in Oregon as well. Um, so that's, for me, that's some of the historical context, at least I try to uh, parallel that with the work I was doing, because I, I feel I have skills and abilities um, to help other Native folks to conceptualize or make sense of the world around them. I think of myself as a systems translator, um, helping folks understand one system and from where they're understanding of that. And so, you know, some of it is a language barrier because each specialized uh, industry has its own language, so that, that's a learning curve right there, but it's not impossible to understand. And so, for me, putting the historical aspect to the, in, the urban Indian experience, to where that is right now, and me having my skills and abilities to work with families who are on this continuum in order to get their needs met, to get their material conditions met, whatever that may be, through these different processes. And so, uh, in my work with work doing social work, at least at that time, the um, families I worked with, you know, I got to see at least one uh, control group of how systems or programs can operate and function well within society. And, you know, you know, still thinking like critical theory and what that may may do with uh, at least the demographic I work with or have worked with. Um, how how do we change that? But you know, our 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 story as Native folks in land dispossession is, that's colonization right there for a lot of folks. Uh, a, a lot of landless folks who were pushed out economically or they were, at least with, within Europe, the, the commons was done away with and they became landless. So you have those folks coming over here and we can start to think about the political economy and how that may impact and push folks to continue the colonization process and the continuing of, uh, grabbing land, resources, and of course labor, and all that would run the, the process. Um, and so that still plays out right now. We are continually being dispossessed um, from land or even some sense of stability and meeting our material conditions. And material conditions being housing, uh, education, healthcare, um, access to food, water, things that you know, make life what it is and within the system that we're trying to do here. And so uh, I put that into the, the concept of uh, labor power and labor issues in that, you know, looking at cart or drawings or cartoons of the labor issues of the early 20th century, those are still playing out right now. I, like right, right now, I visually see the capitalist ruling class uh, having the worker in a press being pressed down by suppressed wages and also being pushed up by landlordism the continued uh, dispossession from our material conditions is still happening right now. Um, we are still in this class struggle, this ideological struggle to um, have everyone's material conditions met. And you know, it's interesting to have these conversations about where we are in their class consciousness to engage with these issues and make the change that we actually, actually need to make the changes of or for or against. And so, um, that, I think in that way, what has happened to Native Americans, continues to happen to Native Americans, also is on everyone else. And that, I think that ties our struggles together in terms of trying to get our material conditions met and understanding what it, what it actually means to have labor power and actually can transform the society that we live in. Um, so the, the, the cultural aspect of uh, poetry to be uh, vehicles to understand or interpret the world or uh, transform the self 
that's some of the work that has to be done, but really in order to have transformation, you need to organize. Uh, actually get together uh, and organize and study education, and of course, uh, from there, go into action and if we want to transform the society we live in. Because we know that, within, at least within uh, uh, the oppressive capitalist system that we are in right now, that they are well organized. They understand the system. It's controlled really well. Um, and people are at different levels to understand their class consciousness, to make sense, and try to transform and get their needs met, the society around them. Um, if we want to have a sense of understanding of livability within the Portland area, you know, I imagine if you, if you want that you actually paid one third of your wages for rent or mortgage. Um, so we can see what the antagonism is there with our access to living, we're being stripped away from that. Ideally, you know, I, uh, I'd rather just give everyone housing. I mean, housing is for people to live and not for speculation, right? And so we understand that we, we are in our collective uh, struggle that we, we are going against, you know, the, the ruling class, what it may be like BlackRock, these, uh, these corporations that buy up land and monopolize areas and destabil destabilize everything. Um, we would have a different world and engagement if we have material, material conditions met you because know, I, I think of, you know, human nature is determined by the material conditions. Uh, culture and ideology is drawn out of the material conditions. So if we have those material conditions met, we have a different relationship with culture and our understanding of our relationships, our social relationships with each other. And so uh, that is worth the fight that we have to do. And when we start to put together a class analysis with that, you know, we have to put our class analysis in life or death, because that what, that's what it is for us. Uh, we're, we're fighting for our life. And with it, with, be it within institutional enterprises uh, that we're selling our labor to for a wage, um, that those are microcosms of the continued struggle that we have to continue to fight for. And so um, that ties everyone together. Um, so yeah, for, for me, the poet is haunted by philosophy. Uh, I think of hauntology. So of course, as I start to look at poetry, then I start to look at philosophy. Philosophy is stripped of poetry because you don't want ambiguity there or all, all these things, these adventures, uh, cognitive adventures that we can go on with, uh, with poetry. But poetry is uh, haunted by philosophy. Really, uh, for me as a poet, is understanding our condition, our condition as humans. And I, I focus in on uh, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and directly on the Ochechishakowin nation, Lakota specifically. And so I start to think about these different layers and how they are interrelated to each other and push and pull and over time has changed or you know, uh, developed into something else. So hopefully within the work I'm trying to do at the moment right now um, with poetry, I'm trying to engage this other uh, discourse into the work. And you know, um, it was a thing where as I wrote poetry, I wanted to do like one book a year and just, even if it's self-published, like just continue that pro high productivity. Um, having gone through the MFA program, now I'm taking my time and like letting things simmer and you know, going to the work later on when I'm at a different emotional time relationship to the initial uh, inspiration of the work that I can come in with the critical eye to see what's actually uh, working within the work or I can develop it further. And so that, that's why, for me, like right now, holding back on the manuscripts I have right now, uh, that's what's happening. But this, I think this came out in 2015. Um, I, I go back to it, you know, um, and previous work I have done as well, you know, th these are documents to see where I was in my understanding of relationships uh, uh, with, with the work itself. And of course, all, all literature, all work, all poetry, and even the creative arts in general are in relationship to what happens in society, right? Uh, on an individual level and to some, ex some extent um, to the national conversation or international conversation because you know, everything's interrelated that way. Do I have, yeah, what's our time? What's that? Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, 
you know, for I think about us as workers who, you know, the worker is one who has to sell their uh, labor for a wage or their labor power for a wage. Uh, it doesn't matter to what extent how liquid that is. Um, um, and if we want to do the class stratification of what that may mean, you know, for me, this is really interesting to see how uh, these different parts work together in a society and what our, our um, what our focus may be, and you know the with with social media as propaganda tool, you know I mean marketing tool, um, you know they're the same thing, propaganda marketing, um, one selling one kind of product, another one selling another kind of product, um, or ide ideology. Um, so you know we as humans we love to labor. Um, we do that all the time in order for our existence to be here. And you think about a capitalist, uh, a capitalist ideology uh, that exploits that labor. And so our relationship to labor becomes different. We become alienated, alienated from our labor. And so if we are continually be alienated from our labor, um, how does that change culture with everyone around us feeling tired, exhausted, um, which you know feels good for the, the 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 boss or the capitalist class that you maintain being tired and exhausted that you don't have time or energy to organize, and so you can start to see the connection of why that's important there, um, especially in our times right now. We think about like you know uh, the continued fascism. Fascism is a uh, immune response to when capitalism is in crisis, and so we see that over and over again. The the rise of fascism in pockets, whatever that may be, in order to control or maintain the control of a capitalist ruling class. Um, and I, I think the, the immune response is really interesting because uh, that means it's always there. And for me, as I work through stuff and thinking about the law of contradiction, the contradiction is always there. And so I'm wondering about the primary contradictions, in this case, you know, uh, imperialism, US imperialism, what that may mean, and tying our struggles to the international struggle, right? So th those are some of the, the, the bigger pictures I start to think about and start to go down into and how to make sense and how, how, how can I engage with literature in a way that uh, deals with some of this stuff. And so that's why I think for me, like memes have been really uh, important, uh, not only as propaganda tools or marketing tools, but uh, ways to engage in discourse, hopefully. Um, but also uh, see how, as a reflection, be it the algorithm or not, um, how what comes back in return in that investment. Because um, we are, for folks, unless you are getting paid to run your pers personal social media account, we are giving away free labor that, uh, you know, they, they get money out of, the, out of the algorithm, right? They sell it to ad agencies and whatnot. Um, and if anything, we should have control of our algorithm data, right? We've created it, we invested time with it. Um, so, I don't know, that was a, I don't know, I was continuing on with the labor stuff right there. But uh, yeah, we can go into questions.